Well, welcome to DriveWire Radio, man. I, we already have a story under our belt, so this is going to rock, Ron. Um, this is not going to be a normal interview by the end. Hopefully, we're best friends. Um, but what it is, okay, so here's how this this show, with the genesis, all of it. Um, yeah. I went to a music school. Near the end of music school, you're getting ready to graduate. You talk to people, and you're like, oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And an overwhelming answer was, like, basically, I have no clue. I really don't know. Right. And... Uh, as like, it's kind of funny, but also it's kind of sad. Like these are, these are some of the most talented up and coming musicians at Metalworks in Toronto. And, uh, they don't, they're, they're going to go to Starbucks or Home Depot or whatever. And look, I don't have yeah. a problem with working there, but if you have this ridiculous talent, let's find out how to market it. Let's find out how to actually turn it into something that you can do. And I believe with whether zoom like this, whether it's Snapchat or TikTok or a following or online or something. I think that artists should be able to support themselves now. That's a belief that I have. I do not believe in the starving artist. I don't think it's like, I think it's unfortunate a reality, but I don't think it necessarily has to be. And so we're talking to people who have, you know, they're, they're real in the industry experience. And you've got a lot of it. You're in the Canadian Indie Rock Hall of Fame with lowest of the low, which is very cool. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I love I love Shakespeare my butt I didn't know the name of the title but that and then I learned uh, the album made me laugh and um, top Canadian albums uh, top 100 of all time in 96 2000 2005 by chart magazine it's very very cool now magazine has you as songwriter of the year in 2000 2015 like you gotta ask did you start for the accolades or did you start for the love of it and the accolades just followed well, it's been, you know, I start I started doing it kind of mucking around when I was 16 and I'm going to turn 56 in November. So it's been <laughs> you didn't have really to remember. say that. <laughs> but uh, but I think well, here's the story. Like I I think I got interested in music like most people do like probably through the Beatles or somebody like that. The Beatles and, you know, just sort of old school stuff, Beach Boys. My my uncle was a big Beach Boys fan, so the harmony stuff and everything and the Beatles and for songwriting and structure and all that kind of stuff and all the, you know, amazing things they did to break barriers and everything. And so that was when I was like, maybe, you know, from a kid up to 14, 15. And then when I was about 16, I started to get super political uh, through school and through the anti-nukes um, movement. And I met a guy who was also very political and we became kind of uh, super close in grade nine. And then we started a band called Social Insecurity. And that band was like a Marxist straight edge punk rock band. And it was because at that point I sort of felt like, oh, I have this love of politics and I have this love of music, but music looks to me like, you know, all, all I really thought about was like people driving their roses into swimming pools and stuff like that. And it was very, I was super against the idea of rock stars and everything. I don't want to be a rock star. I kind of like the folk thing, like Woody Guthrie and Billy Bragg and people like that. And I thought, well, hey, maybe I can put them together. Maybe I can do something with my life and also do something with this love that I have of music. But I don't want to just be an, a cultural entertainer like I you know I want to be I want to make I want to help you know I want to bring something to the table right so I think that's what happened for me is that those things dovetailed really early in my life which is great and um, so I had that band Social Insecurity and that band dovetailed into a band called Popular Front and these were all kind of like big pe uh, pop politics kind of bands you know and we were doing like two-tone ska stuff and punk rock and world beat stuff and new wave stuff and everything and but, you know, that kind of went nowhere, right? It was like, it was interesting for me and it was, and it really drove me, but it really kind of didn't catch on. So maybe I'm getting way too far ahead of myself here. No, but, I uh, like it. I like it. This is awesome. Like I, one of the questions that I was going to ask you was like, you seem to have, so before hearing that, which have, have evidently is like, it was very highly political stuff. It's definitely about your views. I'm wondering like, has that has that served to help you in the long run? Like, has, has it has it gained on traction? Yeah. Obviously, obviously, the people it has not. No, not at all. Okay. No. I mean, it's helped my soul. My soul right. is really is really uh, healthy and and really wonderful. <laughs> okay. uh, it's been a real, you know. I mean, I mean, you know, you know how the music industry, capital I, air quotes goes. You know, it's like <laughs> it's difficult to make. It's it's difficult to convince people who have a lot of money to put that money behind your band if your band is basically talking about dismantling capitalism, you know? And, and every now and then somebody squeaks through, like a, I interviewed for Chart Magazine, I was interviewing for a while and I interviewed Rage Against the Machine. And I, the reason I got that gig was because everybody at Chart Magazine wanted to interview them, but they were kind of scared of the politics of it, like that they were two heavy hitters in Rage and, and so they called me and they said, well, you can probably, you know, 
hold your own with these guys. So I went down and, um, and that was one of the questions I said, you know, like I said, wow, you guys must be fighting every fucking day of your life, right? With the, with your record label. And they said, you know what? No, this is the weird black wormhole where, where, you know, Zach, the lead singer is, is sending money, literally sending money to the Zapatistas in Mexico to buy guns with. And, but they're making so much money for the record label that the record label's like, you know, hear no evil, see no evil. So they got away with there, it, right? There is a market for anti-market. <laughs> yeah. For a while, maybe it was That's one of the around, yeah. But so for me, it's been just, and the only reason it's been, I'm, I've had lots of well-meaning people in the music industry who wanted to help us. And just the way I see the world or the way my band has seen the world has just kind of gotten in the way of our marketability maybe, or in the way of, you know, there were easier paths for us to take, but because we had a certain set of uh, beliefs, you know, we didn't want to do some of the things that it took to go that easy path. So we had to go a harder path and it's not easy to convince other people. You know, it's, it's easy to convince yourself or your band members to go on this path. If you feel if you're waving your flag and you're all on it, but it's kind of hard to convince other people, Hey, this is going to be tough. We're going to take three of the wheels off the car and see if we can just drive it on one wheel. What do you think? You know, most people are like, mm, no, let's, let's have at least three. So when you assembled your team, probably actually you did almost everything yourself until there was momentum. Cause it does, cause you didn't have like the, like I have all these questions and they're out the window right now. Like this is gone. Like we're into a good conversation. You, you're in the point where, okay, I want to make this political statement. But I need, I do need a resource called money to make this statement as big as I want it to be. But my message is kind of like, fuck, fuck this money thing. Yeah. So that that leads to a hell of a lot of problems. And so when you want to get a manager, when you want to get a label, when you want to get like, how did that even happen or like way later? Yeah. So, well, so early, so the only, so the, after the social insecurity popular front, we were kind of going, spinning our wheels a little bit. What year were those? What, what how, what well, believe your, so, you said so 2009, right? Grade nine, right? Yeah. So social security is 1983. Okay. 1980, late 1984. Popular front goes 85 to about 90. So 83, then, what's happening politically that's like got you on fire at that time that really set this off? What was it like? Oh, well, you know, like it was, as I say, sort of, I think the, the gateway drug for a lot of people who become activists is sort of high school, you know, for me, it was the, you know, the anti-nuclear, uh, right. there's a lot That's of on the heels of the cold war, right? Yeah. And it was very palpable. I mean, in a way that it isn't today and maybe it's coming back, I don't know, but I mean, those days it was sort of palpable in the air that, you know, we could be in a nuclear war with the Soviet union at any point. Right. Right. So, so those who took it seriously, took it very seriously. And so that was the door in, but then going in there, you know, you meet lots of hippies, you meet lots of, you know, Rastas, you meet lots of uh, socialists, you meet lots of liberals, you meet lots of everybody. And then you meet the sort of the far left, you meet sort of lots of Marxists and Trotskyists and stuff like that. And those were the people that kind of grabbed my ear in terms of what, because I thought, and this is the thing that, that doesn't help my music career down the line, uh, is that, you know, there's one major enemy for all of these things, for people getting universal health care if they don't have it in countries, for people uh, getting equitable pay, for musicians saying things that are interesting, uh, you know, interesting should be marketable, right? So saying things that are interesting, but don't jive with the sort of consumerism of the usual culture, right? Mm. And you, when you say all those kinds of things, it puts you in a box over here. You're, in, you're, in, you're a difficult person. You're, you know, a leftist. Maybe you're an Antifa member if Donald Trump is talking about you. And, uh, you know, so you become difficult. And, and I always joke now that, you know, I think my band, Lois the Lower, kind of, pretty unmanageable. I think we're still pretty unmanageable, but that's only because we do a lot of things ourselves that, uh, as you said, we did all, all kinds of things ourselves. And uh, so we got misunderstood, misunderstood at the beginning by both uh, groups, which is that the industry didn't want to touch us because they thought we were crazy and difficult and punks. And then the indie were, scene, were they wrong? <laughs> no, I mean, I guess we, but we weren't a little bit by default, you know, it was like, I always joked like, you know, we'll, we'll take a bag, we'll, we'll take a giant bag with a money sign and it has, you know, from somebody, if they let us do our thing, you know, and don't try to change the band into something it isn't. Right. And then the in, indie community mis, mistook us as like, you know, we were always talked about as indie freedom fighters and local heroes and guerrilla, you know, 
punk rock gorillas and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, like that, I'm just saying like, you know, it's just because of our worldview that doesn't work with the industry. You know, the minute somebody, we meet somebody that gets us and says, hey, and we, here's some money to do that awesome thing you guys do. You know, we're not against money. Obviously we, we're not crazy. We know it takes money to make a band. We know we need a van, we need to make records. Like, That's right. That's stuff. right. It would, yeah, it's, it's interesting if you see someone who has, who has kind of denounced the system and then they succeed through their denouncing of the system and now they've succeeded within the system they were denouncing. It's, it's ironic, um, but happens. Like, uh, like Bob Dylan is an example, right? He uh, had yeah. wild success and he started in the 60s like saying, uh, screw the system, essentially. And it's, a, and it's a mind fuck because at some point, if you do get successful, like we got successful, and so, and, and I heard this a lot of the time, Kurt Cobain had a big problem with it as well, is that, you know, you feel like you're on the outside and you feel like you're saying things that are on the outside and then you get accepted. And then you do all this math in your mind. Well, why, so why am I popular now? Am I, is it because the things I'm saying aren't that exciting or different or, you know, and you start to, to mess yourself up. And I, I had certainly had oh. a period, you know, like, because also like when we started, we had this grassroots audience of great, you know, super great uh compassionate people who came you know some weirdos and some punk rockers and you know just people who came to see us and really got into it and then we got a couple of songs on the edge big radio singles and suddenly everybody at our show had a backward baseball cap and was like uh you know like the guys that showed up at nirvana you know nirvana would be going what did we do to attract all these douchey frat boys <laughs> We had the same situation and it was like, we, you start to take it on yourself. Like it's something I did. So, you know, I did so that's so I've never even thought of that. That's awesome. So you start on the outside and you know, this is your, your outside stance. And then your, your outside stance resonates so much that you feel like now you're on the inside and you're like, it's a mind fuck. Does it make you want to change yourself to be back on the outside again? Well, that's the thing. I think this is what separates. Cause I have two things about it, which is that I often think that, super big P politics, uh, lyrically, um, often makes for really bad art, not, not very enjoyable art, or right. it just sounds like a lecture or it sounds, uh, it doesn't sound very sophisticated. And then if you water the political idea down too much, then it just doesn't have any teeth. Right. So you got to do this weird dance where it's like, you want to get the information in there that you think is important, but you also want to make art. You know, you don't want to make, you don't want to give lectures. You want to make art. Right. So that's a really hard dance to do. And when you get it right, it's amazing. Uh, but so for me, I always sort of thought, you know, like art, the job of art isn't to make revolutions. The, that's for people to go in the street and do, but, but the job for art is to make you excited about humanity enough that you want to go and do all the right things in the world. Right. So sometimes that's the thing is if you get accepted, if you're saying all those things and you believe them and, and you've got a big heart and suddenly you become very popular and then it's a problem for you and you have to find some other way to be a pain in the ass, then I think, <laughs> you're not, then I think you have a problem, right? Then I think you're just, you know, you're just a uh, contrarian, I guess, right? Yeah, and that that's why I was wondering, like, if, if someone was on the outside and liked it and then they became, well, like you mentioned Kurt Cobain, I, I heard stories of him like, you know, being vehemently upset that his band's uh, followers were not who he, like, he didn't feel like he was those people. And he's like, where are my people? And oddly yeah, enough, yeah. maybe they're rebelling against his band. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people, you know, because they made a big record, right? Like uh, they had bleach, but then they made Nevermind and it was a big record and there was a lot of money involved in it. And they got uh, Butch Vig and, and it sounds fantastic, but they were kind of upset or they were getting a lot of shit from their crowd about, you know, it's not punk rock anymore. It's like, it's too slick, right? You double track your vocals like John Lennon, you know, it's like, what is that really, is that really the point? You know, like, so I, I so I've, I've been through that. I've had that sort of, you know, I've done that to myself where I've done that kind of mental uh, flagellating about being popular. And then I sort of got over myself and I realized, you know what, any, like, we, like when we started, you, you started talking about people coming out of music school, anybody who, decides when they're 16 years old to pick up a guitar and write songs and, and want to have some kind of a music career who then gets to do it and gets to go out and play and gets to have an, you know, a committed audience of any size, you are a blessed mother effort, right? So 
you should, you have to always be aware of that. You always have to carry that with you. You know, I'm blessed to do what I do. I'm blessed to think out loud for a living. Like, give me a break, right? <laughs> you know, I get to yeah. think, what does what does Ron feel today? Everyone goes to work and artists get to play. Yeah, you find something that you love and it's like play. I, I, like, I don't work, you know, I, I, you know, I work my ass off doing it, but it's like, but it's something I love. So it doesn't ever feel like work, you know? Yeah. So you should know that you should own that and you should just stay true to whatever it is that you're trying to do. And, and again, you know, you can get off track. Like when Lois Lowe got very, very popular, you know, my daughter, you know, we joke around, she talks about, you know, we were famous and I'm like, well, we're Canadian famous, you know? Like, <laughs> you know like, yeah. Yeah. So, so those people who were a big deal to were a huge deal to uh, in Canada and some little pockets of the world as well. But, you know, we're not, we're not Jay-Z. We're not, uh, you know, we're not you two. Like, it's like, we're, we're popular to a small group of people, but it's important to me like that. They're, the kind of we have the kind of base that we have you know are you um like one of the things that i've heard when i when i study this and ask questions to people they say look and you you kind of iterated this you have to be super blessed and recognize how blessed you are even if your audience is like this big well are there ways that you're honoring your audience to intentionally grow it like make them feel super special or are you just trying to put on a kick-ass show and be loud politically every time yeah well i mean I like to think that the kind of relationship we have, I mean, here's an example, and I don't know, again, not trying to, not trying to beat my drum, but you asked me. Um, no, I, that's the whole point is this, I'm interviewing you, man. This is your drum. Like, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to beat it right now. Um, so like when COVID hit, right, here's the kind of audience that comes to see me and the kind of uh, respect I have for them and the kind of relationship we have is that when COVID hit and suddenly we can't do any live shows, uh, two, two amazing things happened, which is that, I started to see people doing live streams and um, for some reason I couldn't get that, you know, I, I produce records for people too. So I'm, I'm not a Luddite audio wise or anything, but I couldn't seem to make Facebook sound good. And mm. it sounded so bad when I was attempting it that I was like, I can't with a, with a clear conscience, you know, let this go out there. And maybe I missed the point a little bit because that wasn't really what it was about. But, um, but I finally, so it took me maybe a month to get, all that sorted out and it finally sounded good enough that I thought I would do it. So since April, I've been doing a free live stream every Tuesday. Tuesdays, right? Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. seen that. Called, and if you see this, so that's a painting right there of Tommy Douglas, that red one. That's right. So it's called Tommy Douglas Tuesdays because I thought when COVID hit, I'm like, I'm glad I live in a country that has uh, socialized medicine. Thank you, Tommy. And uh, so, this, so Tommy Douglas Tuesday, so every Tuesday I was doing a live show live stream uh, and a non-monetized one. It was just free. People showed up. And so there were like 900 people coming to this every Tuesday. And it was like, I just started it and I didn't really have a plan, but I started doing it every Tuesday. And um, as I was doing them, people, I guess, were very aware and concerned about like, well, you have no live shows. They were like, how can I, you know, there should be a tip jar. How can I send money to you? Can I send money to you through PayPal? And I just said, you know, look, I'm, I'm a smart cookie and I've got a little tucked away for a rainy day. So I'm good. But I said, you know, like there are things happening in the world. People need PPE. People need this. I had all these little handmade signs I was holding up. You know, if, you, if you're planning to send me money, send it here. You know, uh, places like the Bear Clan Patrol in Winnipeg, which is uh, a group of uh, sort of alternative police. You know, they, they police with no weapons and they show up there. You know, they're trained to deal with uh, psychological uh, issues as well. So they're so they go and do that kind of thing. So every every week I would try to have three or four places that people could donate money to. Right. Hot, hotlines and stuff like that. And so I felt like that was me saying thank you to an audience that has been there for me for decades. And then I was getting all these lovely messages from people, you know, even like frontline workers and stuff like that were saying, you know what, my life is a fucking living hell right now. And every Tuesday night, at least I get to sort of pop a wine cork and watch you Tommy Tuesday and it, you know, and then there's people in the chat line and they talk to each other. So it's almost like we're at a live show and I have like little bells and whistles, a little effects machine that my daughter had that has hand claps on it and stuff like that. I bring it up and I do that. And so it just became a very, uh, you know, like welcoming people into my living room basically every Tuesday. So I felt like that was a, uh, just a way of me walking, uh, you know, walking the walk that I talk all the time, which is like, you know, I'm here for you guys, you know, and we've been doing it for a year or almost a year. Like we've been doing it for this long. Right? So that's, that's cool. Really cool. I was going to ask you because I stumbled onto that when I was going through your, your website and I, I found um, the, the Tuesdays and, and I was going to ask you, like you support a huge amount of causes 
my question was, has this proven helpful for you in return? But this is just super new. Like, I didn't know that it was just weekly since April. I thought it was closer to like, like I, I, the first thing you have is all the causes first in order of appearance, and then you have your videos. So yeah. as I was rolling through the causes, I kind of thought you were connected with these uh, over a long period of time, but you were just, were, you, were these just causes that are near and dear to you, or were you actually actively Googling for a new one each time? Oh, that's a good one. Let's support that, or... No, again, sort of like it was a great, a great show of community because it was, you know, some near and dear to me. And then friends of mine were, hey, what about these guys? You know, in fact, Bear, Bear Clan Patrol was a friend of mine who cool. from Winnipeg. She was like, what about these guys? People were sending me stuff, you know, and it's, and it's great. Sometimes sometimes it's a, well, for the first 11 weeks, uh, I made this boast that I wasn't going to play any song twice. So I played my entire catalog over 11 weeks it was 19 songs a week. So it was like 210 songs or something. Yeah. So we did that. We had that little journey. And then there's been some requests and there's been, uh, you know, like a cover. There's been, we'll have some cover nights and stuff like that. And so I, I, you're like, I know that I'm in good rapport with my guest when you're leading through the questions that I have written out. And my next question was... Well, I'm also psychic, so... You have... Oh, are, I don't know if you're joking with me or not, but uh, <laughs> you're reading my mind. You have a downright impressive discography. So how do you, one, keep up the consistency? And do you think the quantity has led to the quality? Ooh. I don't know. But it reminds me of my favorite propaganda. Uh, I have a, is it a record where, where quantity is job one? Um, <laughs> well, but, uh, I, I read, I used to study neuroscience at U of T. Like I'm a big loser nerd, right? But one of the things that I studied was about this pottery class. And they were, they said to people, look, group A is just going to do whatever they want. That's your control group. Group B, you're going to make only one pot and you're gonna make it perfect. Spend as much time as you want. And group right. C, you're just gonna make as many pots as you can, just turn them out like a machine. And then they you know, gave them a certain amount of time. And at the end of the time, the people who had created just this huge quantity of pots, not only did they have more pots, but they had much nicer pots by the end. Like the repetition was leading to yeah. the skill that created the best pot. And so yeah. with you, like I was reading, like you have, I think I have it here, you have, so you have six records with Lois of the Low, five solo discs, three records with the Rusty Nails, two records with Ron, uh, Ron Hawkins and the Do Good Is That. Like, it's just a ton, man. Like you said, 200 and some odd songs over 11 weeks and 19 songs apiece. That's a humongous amount. Um, yeah. And obviously you get better each time. Like, it well, must, the, it, yeah, it must period. lead to some skill over time, right? Like, good for you. Well, the 10,000 hours thing, I guess the, you know, that idea of like, uh, takes 10,000 hours to become super good at anything. I don't know. I mean, I, I like to think that I put my 10,000 hours in before any of these records even came out because all these records are only lowest of the low on. So like there were social, yeah. So there was social insecurity music and popular front music that never came out on vinyl or anything like that. Right. But, uh, yeah, I, don't, I guess probably, yeah, I would, I would think that probably, uh, I would have to think that you would get better. You know, this is a thing. This is another thing about the monetization of the music industry that I don't understand. Is it's a very ageist industry. You know, for me to tell you that I'm 56, it's like, Ron, maybe you shouldn't be telling everybody that because, you know, in the music industry, in the film industry, it's like there's this weird. They want youth. Yeah, they want youth, and there's this weird sense that you know you're over the hill. You know, your your career's going to go like this, and then it's going to go like that as you get older because you're out of touch or whatever. And I'm like, they don't, they, you would never say that about a novelist, right? Like, of course, a novelist should be getting better. Of course, a songwriter or a poet, but you know, somebody, sh you should be getting better as you get older. I mean, you, you're, as you say, you're accumulating all of this experience, you're accumulating, you know, I mean, I guess you could say that, you know, maybe people start to spin their tires or they start telling the same story over and over and over again. Right. And they run out of ideas. I mean, maybe they run out of ideas, but uh I don't know. So yeah, so there's that to, to contend with as well, right? Where where are your ideas coming from? Because you you most of your songs, correct me if I'm wrong, from what I could tell, were very much story oriented. Mm -hmm. So well, this have, is a have you run kind of, out of it? Like like how, yeah, how do you keep refreshing the well? Uh, out there, the world, the world refreshes the well for me. I don't have to do it, right? Fair. 
I mean, there's a joke in my family, like my, my uh, partner Jill is always saying, I'll start singing a TV commercial from 1979 or something that I remember <laughs> as a kid. And she'll, go, she'll go like, not only do you know that TV commercial, you know the bridge of that TV commercial. Like, why do you know that? Why, <laughs> what, okay, why do you have that in there? And I'm like, I'm just a sponge. Or my daughter will say, you know, I'll mention something that she doesn't think I should know because I'm too old. And she'll like, how do you know that? I'm like, I just, I'm a, this is a sponge. I walk around the world and stuff goes in here. And it stays in there. And sometimes, sometimes it's immediately useful to me as a songwriter. And sometimes it sits in there for, you know, a decade or something. And then I'll reach back into the mists of time and pull something up, you know, like, like, oh, and that suddenly now that's appropriate or, you know, important or whatever. So I, I just think that I'm a curious person. I love that, you know, there's a Bob Dylan quote that I love, you know, he was not busy being born is busy dying. So to me, that's the choice you have. Like, I'm not religious, I'm an atheist. So it's like, to me, this is what I have. You know, I have, hopefully I have 80, 85, whatever amount of years. And uh, that's it. So while I'm here, I'd like to be as curious as I can be the whole time I'm here and enjoy as much of it. You know, it's like you get a day pass at the amusement park. You want to be on all the rides until it closes, right? Yeah. yeah. You don't want to like leave at lunchtime. So I think I just want to be curious as long as I can. And, and that curiosity is probably what fuels the, you know, and, and I also... I'm interested in, like, as I was saying, I'm doing these big abstract paintings right now. And believe it or not, the abstract paintings are a response to the 10 songs I just released with the Do Good Assassins on a, a record called 246, which we made on a four track cassette recorder. Task nice. <laughs> really? So, now, so these paintings are kind of a dialogue with the songs. So there's even that kind of thing can happen where it's like, you know, a new art form is just a conversation with that other art form. You know? That's right. And you, you said they were oversized, like huge paintings? Well, I mean, not not huge, uh, not huge, you know, Tate Art Gallery huge, but they're like four feet by four feet, which is, that's you know, big. for my house, for my little place I paint in, that's pretty big. Yeah. That's pretty big, actually. Yeah. I, I know, I know that to be true. I love that. So it's very similar there where you were saying how you want to be super curious, go on all the rides until closing time. I've recently decided I want to experience maximum human experience also. Like just, look, this is what I've got while I'm here. I don't know if there's anything after, but I know that I've got something right now. So let's just be maximally involved in what's going on. So mm -hmm. I, I like that a lot. And I can see how over the years you, you would get better. Is it, do songs just come to you really fast now? Is, or, or are you more no, creative? It's not any easier. No. It's not any easier than it ever was. That's that's another cool thing about it, I think. I always say this about songwriting is that, you know, one of the things I love the most is that I do not know what's going on. You know, I know, like some people are like, what's your process? I'm like, well, my process is sit down with a guitar a certain amount of times a week and hope something happens. <laughs> Right. And the thing is, like, I know, I just know from experientially, I know that, you know, for for four decades, something has happened. So there's no reason to believe it will stop happening. But I can't really tell you what the process is. I just muck around. I literally just pack around playing riffs or chords or something. And I'm just singing kind of gibberish, spitting out kind of gibberish that sounds like a melody. And then every now and then... I'll go, you know, like for instance, I have a song called Peace and Quiet. I was like spitting out gibberish and then it was like, peace and quiet. And I was like, okay, peace and quiet. So what is that, what's that about, right? What does that mean? And almost like you, I sort of like retro design it, you know, like a, or a reverse engineer it is what I was looking for. Right. I've got this peace and quiet, you know, that obviously meant something because it popped out right somewhere and so what am i talking about when i talk about that you know yeah the uh, video for that was really cool with you standing on the street and the time lapse behind you and just uh it was uh, very interesting it got my attention for sure i, I watched I, I watched through quite a few of them but that one i watched like the whole thing all the way through eyes on the screen like this is cool there's something that resonated in there with me as well <laughs> i don't know i don't know specifically what it was well yeah. i was gonna say to you just before it this is like as a person who studied neuroscience, I mean, you must be super interested in what's going on in there, right? Like, love it. Like the idea of metaphysics and like, you know, how the brain works and is the brain, is the brain, you know, the, just the stuff about the soul, like those people who talk about souls and those people who talk about what's going on in your neurotransmitters and stuff like that. I mean, you must be, I'm sort of, a, I feel like I'm obsessed with that, uh, but as a very uneducated 
like biologically uneducated guy. <laughs> it's wickedly cool, man. And and uh, I'm really blessed that I, I like people a lot and, and making money on my art. For me, it's design of windows. So I go into people's homes and I'll design them windows. And people say to me when they find out that I've studied neuroscience, they say, well, why didn't you do something that was affiliated with that? And I'm like, you have no idea how much designing your windows and just talking to you as a human being, I'm really using what I know to make sure that we're on the same page or I'm not getting kicked out of your house and I tell you how much the price is or all like, there's a lot, there's a lot right. to it, man. And it, and it does make me wickedly interested in it. It like you, you're, you, although maybe you're biologically uneducated, you're intuitively connected and you're like, well, I just said peace and quiet. That must mean something to me. And that's really, really true. Like there, there's, each human kind of has three different brains and they do three different things. You have your emotional and you have your picture and then you have your linguistic and the, to write a song, you got to start with the emotional and bring it through a picture or a story. And then you have to make it into words and you have to align all three. And it's wickedly difficult to do, which is why I love how many songs you've written. Like, it's awesome. And it sort of seems to start with like a little bit of anger. <laughs> Not going to lie. It looks like you start with anger. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good, it's always a good go-to. There's a joke that, you know, there's a joke in all the Tommy Tuesdays is that, I, uh, I have a song on every record, usually I have a song on every record, which is kind of a, a piss take on somebody who pissed me off that year. <laughs> and, uh, so there's one record, I'm like, you know, that year I had a pretty, really good year and nobody pissed me off. So I wrote a, a song about, uh, about mature me, like let's say 40, 40 year old me at that point, uh, talking to 22 year old me about how much he pissed him off, right? <laughs> if I run out of other people. So I yeah, so back. you just start, you're just like, well, who else pissed me off? Oh, me. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome, I think about how how sort of uh, how entitled or how uh, you know how indestructible I thought I was. That's that's what the whole gist of that story was like. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, getting some of that, it's like you start to understand. Oh, you know, you actually are. The universe can get you. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Totally can. Um, man, I like that. Um, I have a question for you in terms of like like what younger artists now someone starting out guitar in hand writing that song you know they crank it out they think they have a really good song like what next what would you are you would you create it i don't know i'll let you answer like what would you do next yeah well this is the thing this is the thing that really perturbs me because i have lots of friends who are in their 20s who are in bands and i think about you know i joke about when lois the low got art start um you know for for one sweet little five year period or six year period, for some reason 102.1 started allowing their DJs to play, to choose their music and play the music, you know, like I guess like maybe they did way back. And so this little door opened for these indie people like like us and bare naked ladies and all these people that were around at the time. And as I joke, you know, we jammed our foot in that door, you know, and we got. And I always say, you know, not not that I don't think we were very talented and I, and certainly we worked really hard, but all of those things would have added up to a lot less had that door not been a little bit open that we could jam our foot into it. And people like Bookie, Dave Bookman at uh, The Edge and uh, Alan Cross and all those guys. Uh, and that doesn't exist now, you know? And I think if that hadn't existed when in 1991, I wouldn't have the career I have now. I'd have a different career. I'd, may, I'd still have a career and I would still work really hard and release records, but I wouldn't have the career I had now. And um, I don't know, I, I, I mean, Given that how Spotify works, you know, uh, like I was just laughing the other day, I got a SoCan check and j joking with my partner, I was scrolling down the Facebook plays and stuff in the Spotify plays and going, that's uh, 58 bucks, you know? So it's like, I, I, you know, I guess nowadays what you, what you kind of depend on is live gigs, touring if, you, if you're popular enough that you can tour, you know, merch. So, you know, you're kind of left in that boat, like the ways to monetize your music. Uh, it's pretty hard to monetize it straight out of the gate, like selling records like we used to do. Right. So to be honest with you, I'm kind of scared for people in their 20s and I don't really know what to say. I, I would wish I had something super inspiring and positive to say about it. But, um, you know, I mean, somebody will just give you these kind of aphorisms about, you know, well, if you're true to yourself and if you work hard enough, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll happen. Dude, but, I gotta put food on the damn table. And, yeah, and, and I've also seen it not happen. Well, that's what DriveWire is about, right? Like, I'm, I'm asking around, and I'm starting to find 
uh, unique ways. And I'm very open with them. I'm not trying to keep them for me. Like one way would be if a band had even a, even a smaller following, like, like 900 people continually checking in is actually very large. And that's very cool mm -hmm. because, because if you had like, so right now, and I don't know if you would resonate with this philosophically, by the way, but right now you're saying, Hey, these are all these charities. But if another a band was a little bit more lenient on their availability of capitalism and they said, hey, well, I have this Roland Q band and it's really awesome and I really like it. And thank you so much for supporting me. And if you guys like this idea of this amp and you buy one, well, here's a link on my video that if you if you buy it, I'll get a couple bucks when you buy it. So now the music is driving the attention to me but the attention to me could be driving a purchase of something for my audience member, not for me. Like I use the amp because I use the amp and that's what I like. Yeah. But if you like this sound and all these sounds that you could get from this particular amp, and I do actually have a Roland Cube and I do like it and et cetera. Well, then all of a sudden, maybe, maybe I could find a way to say, hey, this is my sound. These are the things that I like. And I'm being honest and genuine because I'm not just selling out to Ibanez because I don't have an Ibanez. Like, do you know what I mean? And then maybe they could be, so there's a lot of things like that, um, but it's going to take a really big thinker. And that's what I'm trying to put together is like, how can we get these people earning dollars? 500 mm -hmm. bucks a week, you can fire your boss, right? And that's, that's what I'm aiming at. I want to find a way to help people make 500 bucks a week. Uh, well, you know, I think COVID, like COVID's a, as, as horrible as it's been for people, I think there's some, the, the silver lining is that it has really shown you know, I think COVID is sort of like the black light in the hotel room, right? It's showing how <laughs> that kind of thing is. you don't want to look, look So, but, but, you know, it's, it's showing out how, how uh, unequitable our system is, but right. also people like, you know, just in a cultural way, like, as I said, I, you know, I couldn't believe how many people were just rushing to the tip jar to try and help me out. So I think that people really, I think fans of music are really understanding, wow, you know, it's, it's hard to be an artist and, and now suddenly I can't even go see them play, you know, they're starving to death out there. And I personally, and it could be, could be that I have the kind of relationship with my personal fan base. Maybe this isn't happening everywhere, but I'd like to think it's happening everywhere. People are having this little light bulb go off like, wow, you know, we really got to take care of our artists because we need them. You know, they're starting to realize what niche that filled for them to go see live bands and how good it feels. And, you know, so I'm hoping that maybe this will turn by the time we get back to whatever normal will look like and we can play live again and stuff like that, that maybe for young bands starting out and everything, maybe the bar will just go up a little bit across the board culturally where everybody will go. We That'd need nice. to respect artists, you know. And maybe not just for music either, but for every art, because, you know, all these people, they do not want to have no Spotify. They don't. Yeah. Artists are no artists. You don't want to be, you know, working in the factory with no radio on. You don't want that. Like, it, it makes your life uh, at least a little bit more bearable, if not enjoyable, to have art. And if that goes away because these artists starve, I think people are going to pay a price that they're not actually willing to pay emotionally. And they don't, they're not even seeing that right now. So hopefully, like you said, people are waking up uh, to that. Really good point. Well, again, back to neuroscience, right? Like, the, there's, it's a defense, it's armor, you know, like your ability to see that the, that the world has humanity in it and have it expressed in ways from different art. I mean, that's not just take it or leave it, buy it or don't buy it. That's, a, and it, that's the vitamins. I mean, like part of know. our soul, man, we need yeah. it. You can't, you can't go away with, without that. Like ever since forever, we've been doing that. And now we, we have to put in a job to make a dollar, whatever that actually means in the first place. And we we've missed out on the whole beating the drum, dance around the fire art. That's our like heritage in a real sense. There's no, you know, there's nothing about well, it. That's what, I, that's what I feel the Tommy Douglases are like, right? The fire is raging. The close, the clan is around here, you know, and out there there's some scary shit going on <laughs> that we need this fire going and we need to all be here collectively together, right? That's because right. All that stuff is, you know, we don't want to take our chances out there in the darkness, right? I love that. You're leading a real culture. So I have a couple more questions. What is... I'm interested in your answer to this one. What is the most important lesson you've learned since you started way back when uh, in the music industry? The most important lesson. Well, I think I think we've been talking about it through all out all of this is just, you know, commit to it. Um, 
listen to the voice inside your head, listen to your heart in your head um, and what they are telling you, you know, when you're, when you're making decisions, because you, you know what you want to do and you know what will make you feel uh, honest about the art you're making. I mean, some people don't want that, right? Some people don't give a shit about that. Yeah. And I, I even like lots of bands that don't care, you know, that don't care to be, to have any kind of um, sociopolitical, of course, you know, like there's a million bands that are just fun, right? Um, and if that's your thing, I'm just saying, if that's your thing, then be true to that. But I mean, like, you just have to be, don't ever phone it in. Don't ever waste a second, you know, be present with it and, uh, and just live it, you know? And don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it because of course you, you know, like we had so many times, well, here you go way back. We're talking about being unmanageable on our first, on, when Shakespeare, my butt came out, we tried to get signed all over Toronto. Nobody would touch us with a 10 foot pole. And so we said, well, you know, and again, lucky for me, that was just at the beginning of when bands could make their own CDs and stuff like that. So we made our own CDs and we uh, started selling them at shows. And by the time we got to something like five or 7,000 CDs sold or whatever, suddenly those phones rang again. Of course, the same people were ringing back. Hey, you know, we've kind of had a second thought, you know, oh, really have you? You know, like, that's a surprise. Now that you know that we've done a lot of the lion's share of the work. <laughs> um, but, you know, the manager at the time, they wanted to put uh, singles on on the edge. And we had a song called Rosie and Gray. And our manager was like, you gotta, guys, we have to have a radio edit for that. And and we were like, fuck that radio edit. And he's like, he's like, it's a minute until you start singing. And he's like, there's an intro, a guitar intro. I've and then it. it happens again on a harmonica. Right. And he's, you know, and it's going radio audiences, you got to be right in with the chorus. You got to, you know, and we were just like, you know, he, as I always say, that like eight fingers would go up, right? When our manager would say that kind of stuff. And then they played it on, on the edge and it became a massive, you know, hit for us on the edge. All one minute intro included, right? And that record was very uh, made on the fly. And, you know, uh, the production values were not great and it didn't sound as good as the other records on the radio, but it didn't really matter. That's not what people were listening to, right? So I'm saying people will tell you, you can't do that. You know, it's never been, you can't do this. And then you do it or you, or you reference somebody who's done it. And they go, oh yeah, but they're blah, 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 blah. And you go, but they weren't that band until they did it, you know? So don't listen to that kind of stuff, you know? I mean, it's good. It's good to have, you know, you don't want yes people around you, but uh, just, you know, make sure everything resonates with you when you make decisions. And if it doesn't throw it out. And if it does, you know, yeah. Take, take the advice and, I, I really like that. I had a, uh, a guest a couple weeks ago and they were, it was double experience. Um, they started, I believe, oh my gosh, I don't even want to say, they started as a band called Colfax and now, and now they're, I think they're from Ottawa. Um, yeah. But they're, they're, they're friends of ours and we've known them and I had them on the show and I said, hey, what's a big lesson for you or what's something that's most important? And they said, well, just know what success looks like for you. And I think that's really close to what you're saying too. It's like, it's like, be true to the thing that you actually want to do. Maybe it's not political activist music, but, but whatever the thing that you want to do is, you've got to stay true to that. And I agree because as soon as you sell out, you're doing it for money and not for love and you're going to burn out after that. But if you stay true, here you are at 56 and saying it proudly because you know you still, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you put it out there. I wasn't going to. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. I'm not that far behind you, man. I'm not that far behind you. Um, so really, yeah, that's more. and also you want to, I, like, I think it was a long time ago, Jane Sibbery, uh, said something about want, just wanting to know that the mistakes on the record were, her, were hers. I think that's val valuable too, because if you yeah. listen to well, like, you know, Jill, uh, writes, writes film scripts and makes films. And, and I said to her a long time ago, I said, you know, she'll hand the film script out to five different people that she really respects. Right. In, in the industry and friends of hers and stuff like that. And I said, well, just be comfortable with the idea that those five experts, you know, people who have, have careers and everything are going to give you five different answers, right? So at some point, it's not really about handing it to somebody or listening to somebody and getting the key or the, you know, it's just like, listen to what they have to say. If it's kind of like you go, oh, that's amazing. I never would have thought of that, but it resonates with me, then incorporate it. You know, if it sounds like, well, I could make that change, but it doesn't. That's not me. Yeah. Then throw that out because it doesn't, you know, you want it to be your thing by the end. Yeah. If it's not your thing by the end, then what are you fighting and struggling for? Like That's right. On a certain level, you're on the level. Like people sometimes ask me, like, who's your favorite musician? And I'm like, that's such a dumb question. Like there are so many, like once you reach that 10,000 hours, let's call it or the level of mastery, then it's not who's better. It's what flavor do you like more? Yeah. And so if you're taking in, 
you know, five different people's script ideas. Um, if, if you, you, at a certain level, you have to accept that you're on their level and you have to say, I'm going to take it if it resonates with me and I, I'm not going to, if it doesn't. And I really like, I like that you said that a lot, man. So how do people log in on Tuesdays for Tommy Douglas Tuesday? It's just on my uh, Facebook, Ron Hawkins Facebook page. All right. You don't have to be a friend of mine or anything. You will become a friend of mine if you come on the TV. Ah, uh, there you go. Kick around the fire, see all the people who are, or, uh, you know, also in the community and maybe donate to one of the cool causes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. I love that. I love that. Where can people support you and buy your music? What's coming out? You have 246 right now, right? 246 came out in August. Yeah, it came decent. out in August. Okay. Uh, Duke Assassin's record. Yeah. Uh, that's available at ronhawkins.com and at Bandcamp. Um, all, and, you know, and all the other places you would imagine, like uh, iTunes and uh, it's on Spotify, all that kind of stuff. So if you are a skin flint and you don't want to pay for it, just listen to it on Spotify. <laughs> I love that you said that, man. I love that you said that. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we've exhausted my list of questions. Hopefully this is enjoyable for you as it, as it was for me. Yeah, it was a great conversation. Uh, yeah, I have a, a lot of lessons that I learned. I really like the be curious part, how you were like, no, I just want to be curious the whole time and keep learning. I think that's very important, right? Like one of the main reasons I just got a bass is because I'm, I'm not feeling like I've mastered the guitar, but I'm feeling like my, I'm actually, ha like for now, I'm happy with where I'm at on guitar. I can, you know, I can do the sweeps, I can do the licks, I can do the, and so I'm like, well, how do I take this to another level? I'm like, how about going a couple octaves down? And I realized that all the movements with my hands are completely different. And I've right. totally reinvigorated my love for music just by going to a thicker string on a different instrument. Like it's really different, yeah, it's uh, different even thing. though it's still called guitar, right? I so love, I the love that. We have that in common. You also seem to enjoy the difficulty. You actually yeah. seem to like, like making stuff hard. <laughs> People around me don't like me doing that's that. Fair. Right. That's I, uh, <laughs> fair. Fair enough. I have a friend yeah. in, uh, in Mexico who says, my friend Octavio says, uh, you know, no problems, no life, right? So it's like, you know, you can you can have a nice, easy life, whatever that would be. I've, I've, it sounds to me like that would be a bore, you know? Me too. I like problem solving. So I guess, I, you know, I guess if I'm just making life difficult for everybody around me all the time, that's not good. But, but you know, I, I like problem solving. So if there's a few Rubik's Cubes to sort out, what would life be without it, man? I like that. Yeah, combinations of loves. So another thing I noticed is, and I, I recently heard this from um, a mentor, that if you have more than one love, for you it was this like folk music, punk music, and politics, and you smash them together, and all of a sudden you have a completely new, like it actually can put you in the realm of where, especially if you mix three, then you're like, no one's even touching it. Like, if you have, if it's politically centered and you're doing paintings and music about the storyline, that yeah. probably makes you one of the only people in the world who's doing that. Right. And I, I love it. Like, I think that's awesome. And, and it also puts power into the people who haven't yet combined three things to say, okay, what are my three things? I don't know. Maybe it's music and cooking and, and stories, or maybe, you know what I mean? Maybe it's, maybe it's children's stuff and stories and, and, like there's, yeah. once you mix the second or third art, and if you're a creative uh, individual, I believe that it'll be fairly easy for you to pick up these other arts. Um, yeah, well, and the other thing I was gonna say to you about people starting out is that whatever you do, I mean, friends of mine will joke that, you know, I, like I, I often take things on that are way above my skill set. You know, that I have, I always joke that I have really no right trying to do like building furniture or something. Like we bought our house and it was like, paying people to do this, paying people to do that. And it was like 2000 bucks here, 5,000 bucks there. I was like, fuck that. I'm going to buy a table saw. Right. So I, bought a table <laughs> saw and I, was, I started building, like I did all our fencing and everything out in the front. And I started building furniture because I like sort of mid-century modern kind of stuff. So I was building this furniture that was wood and plastic and, and all this stuff. And I have a friend who's a great, super great carpenter. He's really, really good. And he, and he mentioned something about clamps out of nowhere. And I said, what are clamps? And he was like, what are clamps? And I said, yeah, and he goes, how are you holding stuff together while you're, and I'm like, what's my knees? And you know, like, so, but some of the stuff looks pretty good. And it's like, uh, that's funny. I think that's important too, is like, 
don't wait. I'm not saying you should. Uh, I mean, when you start getting into chainsaws and table saws, it's you know maybe, maybe you got to look. Don't hurt yourself. Well. But you got to start, man. You got to start, right? Like if you if you hadn't started, you'd be so much further behind. I was uh, I was sent a song, a very easy to play song on uh, on guitar to learn for a rapper a few weeks ago, and right. I learned it. And it, I learned it, but I didn't realize that this guy was using a capo. So I learned it as arpeggios, which is like for everybody listening, it's just like a chord, but one note at a time. And I learned it in the most difficult way. And I come into the studio and I'm playing it. And the guy who wrote it is there and he started laughing. He's like, what are you doing? It sounds right, but that's wrong. And he showed me and it was like, a simple one, four, five in G with a capo on the fourth fret. And I started laughing. I was like, are you kidding me? Like I learned it. But the, in a sense, like you improve your skill if you do it without clamps and then someone gives you clamps later and you're like, oh my God, I can do it. <laughs> right? Like it was probably much easier once you figured out. Oh, I can oh, just yeah, my head is what, is a, what is a capo if not a clamp for your guitar? It's literally the same thing, man. It's the same thing. It's a perfect full circle to end it, man. Ron, thank you. This is really fun. I, I enjoyed yeah. my conversation with you very much. Thanks for coming on DriveWire Radio. Good. When we can uh, do a live, I would love to get you in and, and we'll, we'll actually do this in studio and we'll make some noise in there, record, maybe get a song live on, on air and everything yeah, like yeah. that. Awesome, Thanks, man. man. Thank you so much for joining me, dude. Thanks you, man. That was a great interview. That was really uh, fun. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll, we'll get it out there. We'll make sure that you are connected. We'll cut it into pieces. We'll put it all out all at once, whatever we find uh, works best. And we'll know as soon as we have it all set up, all right? Thanks, man. Really appreciate your time. Oh, love is a tragedy A theater of cruelty And you got that front row seat